Our government-issue textbooks tell us that Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. The dictionary says to discover means to learn something unknown. But the tens of millions of indigenous Indians would certainly contest Columbus's discovery of anything. Perhaps the occult meaning of discovery coincides with Columbus's occult knowledge of exactly where he was going. Perhaps the word discover means just that, to take the lid off something that has been covered up. Michael Tessarian wrote, We may fairly agree that the subject of history, as commonly taught, is one of the most boring of all subjects. However, the study of how the subject of history has been manipulated is surely one of the most interesting of all subjects. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote, The falsification of history has done more to mislead humans than any single thing known to mankind. And Voltaire wrote, History is the lie commonly agreed upon. David Icke wrote, The Phoenicians were not confined to the Mediterranean and the Middle East. They landed in Britain around 3000 BC, and unmistakable Phoenician artifacts have been found in Brazil, as well as possible Egyptian remains in the Grand Canyon in America. The Phoenicians landed in the Americas thousands of years before the manufactured photo opportunity, better known as the journey of Christopher Columbus. The reason that the native legends of the Americas speak of tall white gods coming from the sea bringing advanced knowledge is because that is precisely what happened, if you forget the gods bit. When critics objected saying Columbus's mission was impossible, he often countered these objections saying he, quote, might discover some very beneficial island or continent about 750 leagues to the west. At this point, the ships would be able to restock on food and supplies and continue on towards Asia. Then, lo and behold, Columbus discovered a very beneficial continent precisely 750 leagues to the west. Alex Christopher wrote, In the agreement signed on April 17, 1942, the Capitulo, and on April 30, 1492, the Titulo, the strange fact is that more attention is given to the rulership and jurisdiction of problematical lands that might be discovered en route than to a division of spoils from wealthy Asia. In Scotland's Knights Templar Rosalind Chapel, there are clear depictions of corn and aloe cactus found on the archways and ceiling. These plants were officially discovered in America and first brought to Europe in the 16th century. How then did the Masons building Rosalind Chapel, completed in 1486, know about these plants at least six years before Columbus set sail? David Icke wrote, The official story that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas is ludicrous. A few miles from Edinburgh in Scotland today still stands Rosalind Chapel, that holy grail of the Brotherhood elite. It was built in the shape of a Templar cross by the St. Clair Sinclair family and is a mass of esoteric symbolism. The foundations were laid in 1446, and it was completed in the 1480s. How remarkable, then, that the stonework at Roslyn includes depictions of sweet corn and cacti, which were only found in America, and Christopher Columbus did not discover that continent until 1492. How could this be? There is, in fact, no mystery. Christopher Columbus was not even nearly the first white person to land in the Americas. The Phoenicians, Norse, Irish, Welsh, Bretons, Basques, and Portuguese all sailed to America before him, and so did Prince Henry Sinclair of Roslyn, as documented in a rare book by Frederick I, Pole called Prince Henry Sinclair's Voyage to the New World, 1398. Sinclair made the journey with another Brotherhood bloodline, the Zeno family, one of the most prominent black nobility families in Venice. Sinclair and Antonio Zeno landed in what we call Newfoundland and went ashore in Nova Scotia, New Scotland, in 1398. 
The Brotherhood had known about the Americas for thousands of years, and Christopher Columbus was used to make the official discovery so that the occupation of the Americas could begin. Columbus's supporters were European royalty and the Templars. His father-in-law was a former Templar knight, and Catherine de' Medici of the Illuminati bloodline, along with others, financed his voyage. Columbus's three ships sailed under the Templars' Red Cross flag, used today by the Red Cross and Switzerland. The royals also sent out fleets of conquistadors and swashbuckling pirates flying the skull and bones flag, their orders to rape, kill, and pillage all they could from the New World. Michael Tessarian said, The skull and bones cross used by the secret society comes from the pirate skull and crossbones. They weren't just a bunch of swashbucklers like you've seen in the movies. No, these were agents sent onto the high seas by the British royal family to colonize the Americas. The Knights of Columbus' third-degree emblem is a fascis, the fascist symbol. The fascis symbol is an axe supported by bundled reeds, representing the power of the many when bound to one ideal. Interestingly, the fascis is also found at the U.S. Senate, the Colorado Seal, the Lincoln Monument, the Dime, and many other places. The Knights of Columbus seem to be a philanthropic male fraternity, so what does the symbolism mean? Perhaps the hidden history of their namesake, Christopher Columbus, will shed some light. David Icke wrote, The most obvious symbol of the Brotherhood's intent is the fascis, from which we get the word fascism. You can see it at the bottom of a United States liberty symbol, and in the Congress building. It was a symbol used widely in the Roman Empire, and it consists of rods bound together around an axe. When Columbus first came ashore and was greeted by the Arawak Native Americans with smiles, gifts, and food, he wrote in his log, quote, They brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things. They willingly traded everything they owned. They do not bear arms and do not know them. For I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would make fine servants. With fifty men, we could subjugate all of them and make them do whatever we want. From the very outset, Columbus was writing about conquering and enslaving the natives. Meanwhile, the Arawaks brought gifts, prepared food, and traded everything they owned. Columbus wrote that the natives, quote, are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with anyone. He also wrote, quote, I believe that they would easily be made Christians, because it seemed to me that they had no religion. The European settlers took a free society without possessions, property, currency, hierarchy, or written religion, and replaced it with today's America the world's shining beacon of selfish materialism, where every square inch of land, water, and airspace is publicly or privately owned, taxed, and governed through a corrupt hierarchical system of laws and regulations, where Mother Nature's gifts are treated as personal possessions to be bought, sold, owned, and defended. Columbus wrote, As soon as I arrived in the Indies, on the first island which I found, I took some of the natives by force, in order that they might learn and might give me information of whatever there is in these parts. The information that Columbus wanted most was, where is the gold? His second expedition was given 17 ships and more than 1,200 men. The aim was clear, slaves and gold. They went from island to island in the Caribbean, taking Indians as captives, roaming the island in gangs, looking for gold, taking women and children as slaves for sex and labor. Helen Ellerby wrote, It was Columbus's avowed aim to, quote, convert the heathen Indians to our holy faith that warranted the enslaving and exporting of thousands of Native Americans. That such treatment resulted in complete genocide did not matter 
as much as that these natives had been given the opportunity of everlasting life through their exposure to Christianity. The same sort of thinking also gave Westerners license to rape women. In his own words, Columbus described how he himself took his pleasure with a native woman after whipping her soundly with a piece of rope. By 1508, the settlers were responsible for three to four million Native American deaths. We are not talking about some guy who accidentally bumped into America looking for a spice trade route to India, but that's what the standardized textbooks continue to tell our children. Columbus, the conquistadors, the pirates, and many pilgrims were hostile and ruthless groups of settlers who were collectively responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of natives. Howard Zinn writes, The Spaniards thought nothing of knifing Indians by tens and twenties and of cutting slices off them to test the sharpness of their blades. Las Casas says, From 1494 to 1508, over three million people had perished from war, slavery, and the mines. Who in future generations will believe this? I myself writing it as a knowledgeable eyewitness can hardly believe it. Bartolome de la Casas was a Catholic priest who witnessed the atrocities being committed in the name of God and wrote prolifically denouncing his fellow countrymen. Bartolome de las Casas sailed to the New World in 1502 and recorded many of the things he saw in his book The Devastation of the Indies. He wrote, With my own eyes I saw Spaniards cut off the nose, hands, and ears of Indians, male and female, without provocation, merely because it pleased them to do it. Likewise, I saw how they summoned the chief rulers to come, assuring them safety, and when they peacefully came, they were taken captive and burned. The Spaniards took babies from their mother's breasts, grabbing them by the feet and smashing their heads against rocks. They built a long gibbet, low enough for the toes to touch the ground and prevent strangling, and hanged thirteen at a time in honor of Christ our Savior and the twelve apostles. Then straw was wrapped around their torn bodies, and they were burned alive. When the Spaniards had collected a great deal of gold from the Indians, they shut them up in three big houses, crowding in as many as they could, then set fire to the houses, burning alive all that were in them. Yet those Indians had given no cause, nor made any resistance. They would cut an Indian's hands and leave them dangling by a shred of skin. They would test their swords and their manly strength on captured Indians and place bets on the slicing off of heads or cutting of bodies in half with one blow. On every island Columbus discovered, he planted a cross, claiming ownership for his Spanish Catholic patrons. He read declarations of God-given rights to the natives' land in a language they couldn't understand, saying, I certify to you that with the help of God we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you, and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church, and shall do you all mischief that we can, as to vassals who do not obey and refuse to receive their lord and resist and contradict him. Perhaps you can understand why the word cretin derives from Christian. Native American chief Hatui was captured and burned alive by the Christians. As he was being tied down, a Franciscan friar urged Hatui to take Jesus into his heart so that he may go to heaven and not hell. The chief replied, that if heaven was where Christians went, he would rather go to hell. John Mohawk of the Seneca said, Christopher Columbus is a symbol, not of a man, but of imperialism. Imperialism and colonialism are not something that happened decades or generations ago, but they are still happening now, with the exploitation of people, dispossessed from their land, and forced out of subsistence economies and into market economies. Those processes are still happening today.